Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the ILN Talk Show, uh, a free space to discuss different developments in Muslim majority countries and beyond. Um, and today is our 12th um, episode, and this is our third women guest um, in this uh, talk show. And I'm very happy to have uh, Miss Ivy Joshia with us. She's a very particular person, and you'll know why in a minute. Hello, Miss Ivy. Welcome to our show. Hi, Tasdim. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So Ms. Ivy is a teacher, um, a trainer, and women's rights activist um, in Malaysia. And this is exactly the heart of our talk today. We're going to be talking about uh, the Domestic Violence Act in uh, Malaysia and in the Muslim uh, world and also in the world in general. Um, and um, before we start, when we were, you know, starting to um, organize this talk show, I was talking to you and Saivi, and we were yeah. talking about suggestions about what we're going to focus. And you were like, could we talk about um, how we managed to pass the Domestic yes. Violence Act in, in, in Malaysia? In and Malaysia. I was like, how we managed? So at this turn, it wasn't easy. There were a lot of challenges. So could you, could right. you talk about this a little bit? Right. Um, I mean, first, we, we, we must understand that Malaysia is a multiracial country, of course, majority mm -hmm. Muslim. And Malaysia is, uh, is defined as a, where Islam is the, uh, is the official religion of the country. So quite a number of our policies, uh, our, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the way the, the country is being developed does rely on Islamic interpretations and Islamic teachings. Mm -hmm. But then again, because we're a multiracial country, even the constitution is very clear that Islam is the religion of the nation. Um, but of course, other religions as in Christianity or Hinduism or Taoism yes. yeah. are all you know, allowed or do they do exist? And there is, the, and we all should, will have the ability and have the freedom to practice Right. And yeah. what is very interesting about Malaysia is because it's a multiracial country with different races and different religions, we've always learned how to negotiate, you know, whether it is the Hindu, yeah. whether it's Hinduism or, or, uh, or Islam or whether it is you know, Christianity. Um, from the very beginning, when we started work on domestic violence, we had to unpackage how does domestic violence, you know, um, reflected in Christianity in Hinduism, mm -hmm. in Buddhism, mm -hmm. yeah. in Islam. So domestic violence in this country, the discussion and the public um, uh, the, the debate around domestic violence really began yeah. way back in the 80s. So in 1982, okay. in Malaysia for the first time, I was part of the group, pioneer group, or pioneer group of volunteers and members mm -hmm. that opened the first shelter in this country, a shelter specifically to uh, give protection to women who suffered from domestic violence. Okay. Now, when we opened the shelter, we did not say, oh, this shelter is only for non-Muslims. This shelter yeah. is only for, you know, I mean, although people kept saying, can everybody come in? We were very clear from the very beginning, it's a shelter for all Malaysian women. No matter what religion you are from, whether you're foreign, whether you are a citizen, yeah. it's open to all women. It's really great. 82 when we opened the shelter and at that time there was no law on domestic violence all we okay. knew was that it was very service oriented we knew that we had to open a shelter because there was domestic violence cases and the, when the first phone call came and the women started coming to the shelter we realized there were many many obstacles there must be first, law. yeah there's no yeah. law there's yeah. no law so a woman may go to the police station and they'll go, well, that's no law. It's a domestic problem. It's a family problem. It's a mm -hmm. private problem. Mm -hmm. And women's aid organization was very much service oriented at that time, but very quickly the social workers and the volunteers. So at that time I was a volunteer. I had just graduated mm -hmm. from university. We soon realized that we need to tackle the law. It's just not service. You know, yeah. we, we can't say women come, leave your uh, violent uh, relationships, like that. Yeah. but how do you get protected? So we started, um, you know, uh, talking about a law, uh, a draft law. And again, the women's groups came together. We knew mm -hmm. we couldn't do it alone. So yeah. it was Women's Aid Organization, Association of Women's Lawyers, um, you know, uh, what else? Um, all Women Action Society, and a group that was also just beginning to form itself. They hadn't given themselves an official name, but a group of Muslim women 
who are also gathering in someone's home, Zaina Anwar, she's a very famous you know, Muslim uh, activist. They were mm -hmm. also gathering and also asking this question, is domestic violence allowed in Islam? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So in the beginning, when we started talking about the law, protection, prevention orders, um, a woman who's able to leave her husband's house and seek shelter someplace because her life is in danger, very soon we started getting obstacles. I mean, not only from the Muslim community, but generally from people. First of all, people felt, oh no, you can't leave your husband. You know, right? I yeah, mean, that kind of mentality, yeah. Patriarchy is very, it's very strong in almost every community Absolutely. all over the world. We know, yeah. statistically, statistically speaking, one out of three women are, you know, are sexually abused or suffer from some form of violence. Mm -hmm. So when it came to Malaysia, uh, we were very clear that we wanted a law to protect all women. So um, first of all, a group was formed, a coalition was formed, and we were mm -hmm. called the Joint Action Group Against Violence Against Women. This was then in 1985. The shelter opened in 82, and then 1985, we said, let's, let's you know, figure this out. We need to start going into policy. We need to go start yeah. looking at law. We just can't be looking at services. And um, so all of the civil society activism, no government involved whatsoever. Uh, initially, no government involved. Okay. We just mm -hmm. started lobbying. We started having public education seminars. We started having events. The first uh, forum or workshop at that time was there was no government involved. In mm -hmm. 1985, when we had our first forum, and it was on March 8th. And as you well know, March 8th is yeah. globally you know, celebrated all over My the world. My birthday too. I'm really proud of yes. it. Yes. It's your birthday <laughs> too. Oh, you have bought on a very beautiful <laughs> day. International day yeah. uh, for women, right? Um, so yeah. 8th of March being International Women's Day, we started having this, we began our lobby. And at that time, in the, the first forum on violence against women, we talked about domestic violence, we talked about rape, we talked about pornography, you know, so there were many, yeah. many other forms of violence. But somehow the uh, campaign specifically on the Domestic Violence Act took off from 1985. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And eventually we got the attention of the government. Okay. And a joint committee was formed. Perfect. And we started looking at a draft bill. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. there was resistance. So even the government uh, representatives who sat in front with us looking at the draft bill, they were saying that, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that a woman was able to leave the house or even kick out the bachelor, you know. Why, why should she have to leave the house? I mean, the, 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 yeah. the bachelor, the perpetrator. But, you know, we were told things like, oh, no, 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 the man is the castle of the house. If she has to leave, you know, mm -hmm. um, she has to go and find shelter and so on. And then there was this argument because in a country like Malaysia, we have Muslim Sharia law and family law, yeah. were very specific. Muslim women, they were covered by Sharia law. They were covered okay. by Muslim law when it comes to family. So when it comes to divorce, marriage, uh, you know, um, and, and, and matters like that, it comes to yeah. family law, they were subject to Islamic family law. Whereas mm -hmm. someone like me, I'm a Christian, I'm not, I'm a person of another faith or what they say, yeah. non Muslims. I am subject to civil law. So yeah. then there was an argument when it comes to domestic violence, of course, it's family. It's According a, to which law, law. this is going to be? It, yeah. be? it cannot be covered by a new act or a new bill or a new law. It has to come under family law. So Muslims mm -hmm. will have to be subject to, Muslim women have to be subject to the family, Islamic family law. And you as a Christian, you go and get subject yourself to civil law. Mm -hmm. And we will not have that. We did not want that. Yeah. Okay. Because it should be the same for everybody. Everybody. Equal yeah. protection. Because in a country like Malaysia, when there are, okay, my geography is going bad at this moment. There are 11 states in this country. I hope okay. I'm right. Okay. There are several states. Each state had an Islamic family law that differed. Different one. That's a different one. There, oh, there were wow. some similarities. You know, okay. there are some similarities. You know, for example, child marriage is banned in three states, whereas child marriage is not banned in some like other... federal system, something like that. Yeah. So it's a 
Mm. When it comes to Islamic family law, it's not federal. You know, each state oh. had the had the uh, the right, had the option to implement uh, Islamic family law or any of for that matter Islamic law according yeah. to what they want. You know, okay. And Congo is pretty similar. So we said first of all, all the different states have different Islamic family law, and it will not be consistent. Yeah. And the crucial point was this. We must not view domestic violence as a family matter. Mm -hmm. It's a crime. Yes, now, what is interesting, yeah, what's interesting about Malaysia is crime is a federal matter. So mm -hmm. if I were to murder somebody, I will not be subject to hudud law. Absolutely. I will be subject to the penal code, right? You know, yeah. I may be you know, I, I may be a Muslim and I, I stole some something. I, I'm a robber. I'm a murderer. I'm a whatever. I commit some kind of crime. Yeah. I will not be subject to the Hudud law, okay. but I'll be subject to the penal code, which is applied to everyone. So mm -hmm. we had to make the decision and we made the decision to make domestic violence, the bill at that time, which, which took about almost 11 years to become you know, a fact, okay. that law became attached to the penal code, we made the law into a criminal law. Wonderful. So, so that was the strategy that- That's what it is anyway. Yeah. Adopted. And Perfect. to look at it that way. But but it's one thing saying that, and finally in 1994, it was we passed, passed that, that yeah. Yeah. And that was even, even in 1994, the Minister of Women at that time had to pass the law. I mean, she, she presented the law like at midnight when all the MPs were kind of sleepy and didn't ask too many questions. But the, M the members of Parliament were making jokes and we finally passed the law at in midnight. I can't remember the month, but it was midnight 1994. It was, okay. it was a day midnight. That's interesting. And then, you, and then you sit back and you go, okay, great. We've been talking about this law. We've been telling going around Malaysia, there now. Yeah. Walk everybody, the law will protect you. You can get a protection order. You are allowed to take your children away. You'll get a, a, a letter, some kind of an order from the magistrate that we that we sent to the to the to your husband to say he mustn't come anywhere near you. So we're very happy. Mm -hmm. And then 1995 came by, no sign of the law. <laughs> 96 came by, no sign of the law. They passed the law. But it was not implemented. It was not implemented. Okay, okay. So Another best. The resistance. Okay. You know, which was the resistance. And so in 1996, on March 8th, on International Women's Day, Women's Day, we staged yeah. a protest. Okay. But I must also tell you that before I talk to you about the protest, that in order to even get the law passed in parliament, we had the help of Sisters in Islam, who by then, remember the law was passed in 1994. Yeah. In early 1990s, they'd already come out with a, a booklet, a, you know, a, a, a title which was very quite controversial at that time, but not anymore. And the title was, Are Muslim Men Allowed to Meet Their Wives? Mm -hmm. So yeah, they I can see it was controversial. Quran. I mean, of course, essentially, we, you and I know, you know, even I, I, I'm of another faith, I'm not a Muslim, but I can very, very confidently say that Islam is a religion of peace. Absolutely, right? yeah. Right. And how I mean, can... women, men are told to treat their women in the best of ways, but all of these right. things are happening because of a misconception of, of, of religion. Um, it's the patriarchy, yeah. of them. it's yeah. the good old yeah. patriarchy. It's not the religion, yeah. it's just basically the patriarchy. So, they they were they were already you know sending letters to the editor you know educating the public so that the community at large were also ready to accept the law so that mm -hmm. they you know uh, so that the com Muslim community also didn't feel that oh no uh, my husband is beating me I cannot leave the house I must get permission how can you get permission from the actual perpetrator the very perpetrator to say can I leave the house <laughs> no that doesn't no. doesn't make sense yeah. yeah. So in 1996, back to 1996, on International Women's Day, we staged a protest. Uh -huh. uh, at that time, there was a different minister of women. We, a few of us, was a motley crowd, about 30 people. And, you know, mind you, in 1996, I mean, it's, it's a long way from these days, protests 
There are so many protests. <laughs> but at that time in 1996, we were still very scared. You know, we were scared of will we be arrested. We made sure there yeah. were lawyers on standby and so on. We, we, we did a huge banner to say, implement the Domestic Violence Act now. And the newspapers, they, they put us on in the front papers. Okay. And of course, the protest was multiracial. It was Muslim women, non-Muslim women, Chinese, Indian, you know, uh, Malay mm -hmm. women. It was, you know, and, and, and some men too. Yeah. And then the debate started again. Oh, okay. no, we can't do it. We haven't got the approval of the uh, the minister at that time. was saying we haven't got the approval of the, from the Muslim authorities. But remember, the sisters, sisters in Islam had already done their homework mm -hmm. over the, you know, from 85 right up to 1996, they have been talking to the Muslim authorities. Okay. And the Muslim authorities came out and say, you know, we have no, we have no problems with it. Mm -hmm. Let's have a law to protect Muslim women. Let's have a law to protect all women in Malaysia. And it was and, implemented then. As I, and it was implemented. It was in, immediately implemented. But mm -hmm. again, I go back to the law is, the written law is Per, could, can be perfect or near perfect. It's all there. You need to get protection. You can, yeah. You're can. you allowed to, uh, you know, seek shelter. But when but the in, law in was... In real life, is different. In real life, is different. In 1996, again, the patriarchy, the culture, what we call the culture of the law, in order for a woman to get yeah. a protection order, first of all, she has to file the complaint, make a police mm -hmm. report, and then also make a report at the welfare department. Okay. Go to, go to, got to go to two places. Mm -hmm. We go to the welfare department, and the welfare department, the poor welfare officers who don't want to do this, but they were told that they need to save the marriage first. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. there were all these steps. Then we we were wondering why was it taking such a long time to get a protection order, because the welfare officer in 1996 was told was against was. They were the instructions. Yeah. Save the marriage. Call the husband. Call the man in. Try to get him to change. But we know domestic violence doesn't work like that. I mean, right? these things do not change overnight. Even if you have a low past, it, it gets you to, to change the culture, and and this, you know, you know, takes time, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually so that, wanted to ask you particularly about this this um yeah. this very it's detail. Not it's not going to turn up at the welfare office and say, say "I'm a changed man now." <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We are waiting and waiting for the perpetrator to turn up. And of course, there's a delay in protection. So again, we had to continue lobbying to say immediate protection. When it comes to yeah. domestic violence, you can't wait. In fact, when the wife leaves all over the world, we know, and this is a fact, the time when you leave the, your, your family home, the home where there was domestic violence, yeah. that's the most dangerous time. You need mm -hmm. protection. You need a police order. You need a court order. So yeah. then, thankfully, I mean, they listened to us because the shelter was still running, right? Women's Aid Organization, we were still having those experiences. So we were sharing the actual reality on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, the lived realities of women. And we said, we need to get immediate protection. You can do all the counseling later, but get yeah. the court order. Yeah. So now you can get an emergency order within 24 hours. Perfect, perfect. So, so it, took, it took a lot of time. Um, it took a lot of time. And um, I, back to my question earlier um, on this as well. When you when we look your name up, uh, all we can see on, 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 on the internet is that you have been described as helping to put domestic violence on the national agenda. And you actually oh. said that you never saw it as charity work, but it's activism. Um, so That's a lot true. of people see it as charity work or it's just a just some good work and you know to save the marriage and all of these good things. Uh, mm -hmm. Why do you think we have to we have to fight to put this on on national agenda? Why do you think it's actually rather activism? It's not something a good deed or anything like that. That's the mentality even now. Yeah, right. We, we, we're really challenging the patriarchy, aren't we? We're challenging institutions. We're challenging men's power. We uh, and it cannot be done. You see, there are two components here. Yeah. I don't like, like the word charity because charity means I I'm up here. And I look down and go, oh, you poor things. Let me help you. Let me pull you up. You know, yeah. as a feminist, I think all, mm -hmm. we all are equal. When a woman suffers from discrimination, 
I too understand what you're going through because I may not, you know, experience domestic violence, but I too have experienced discrimination. All yeah. of us as women have this have experienced some form of violence against women. I say that very confidently. You're yeah. harassed, yeah. sexual harassment. You get up on a yeah. bus, you travel on public transport, people touch That's you, grab everywhere. you. you know? yeah. So so we are in this together. We are walking together. We are not like, oh, you're there and we'll help you and so on. So activism, I like the word activism because activism is to advocate, is to bring about change. And change over time. Comes about over time, doesn't come easily, doesn't come, of course it comes with negotiations, yeah. but it also comes with a lot. You have to confront the issues. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. to confront mm -hmm. the issues. I mean, okay. I say the story many, many times. Many people said to us, the, the activists and the volunteers of Women's Aid Organization in, in the 80s, they said, oh, no, 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 Malaysian men do not beat their wives. No, no, no. This only happens in the West. Right? Okay. And guess what? The shelter is still up and running. It's still having lots of clients. Still, women are still coming. So, yeah. Activism, mm -hmm. I prefer the word activism. It means okay. Okay. Uh, actively, actively doing something about it, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're, mm -hmm. not, yeah. uh, you're not passive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, speaking of the, the shelter that's still up and running, um, based on statistics uh, published by your organization, the Women's uh, Aid Organization, there were uh, more than 5,000 reported cases of domestic violence in 2018. And mm -hmm. the statistics also show that the majority of both domestic violence survivors and perpetrators are individuals between the age of 26 and 35. Do you think these numbers increased now and um, has COVID played any role in this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just for the record, I'm no longer um, you know, working for Women's Aid Organization. I retired yeah. And I put it in inverted commas because a family just never retires. We are always Absolutely. doing something, yeah. right? Um, so I retired in 2015. And uh, so during the COVID period, you know, Women's Aid registered a higher number of phone calls to the organization because COVID was a time, and this was an experience that it, it was happening. It's a phenomena. It was happening all over the world. You know, can yeah. you imagine? It's COVID. We're stuck in the house. You don't even have the freedom to leave the house and go to work and have that respite and have that time at the oh, office space. You know, yeah. to have that space. You're in the house. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of frustration. There's an economic, economic downturn. And the children are in the house. The children are witnessing this tension. Yeah. So there were in an, in an increase in domestic violence uh, reports. Even Children were calling the children's helpline because they were witnessing all of this, the fighting mm -hmm. that's going on. And um, so what we did in Malaysia, not all over Malaysia, but in the, the state that I stayed in, in uh, that I live in, uh, they actually initiated uh, uh, you know, a, a helpline where women could leave. They couldn't come to the shelter because the shelter was at that time shut down because it meant you needed to be tested and so on. So things were not operating the same way. So mm -hmm. the... Slango government actually yeah. started opening some hotel. They booked hotel rooms. Oh. And, you know, women were allowed to go to the hotel rooms and live there on their own because mm -hmm. it was very, it's a very strange time. It's not like, you know, we could go to the person's house, rescue her, or she could come out because we're not allowed to get out. Yeah. yeah. The, there was a movement control order. We are hotels not are empty anyway. Sure. This was a situation which was ripe which was so conducive for a perpetrator. I have you trapped in the yeah. house. Can you imagine what, what a horrible, terrible environment it must have been for women and children? Yeah. Or no yeah. matter anyone who's being abused in the family. I mean, it, it can be also boys and men too, but of, of, obviously it's an epidemic when it comes to women. You know? yeah. Um, so yeah, COVID was a bad, bad, bad time for mm -hmm. women who was, mm -hmm. who was exposed to domestic violence. It escalated. Glad it's over now. I mean, almost. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Over. we're never sure I about that. Say, we can't say the yeah. same for violence against women, right? <laughs> we hope, we hope, we hope one day we can say that. Uh, I have a very strange question, but a lot of people are asking it. Um, have you ever encountered any case where the perpetrator is a woman? 
Yes, uh, very rare, very, very, very rare. I have, um, I mean, I think, look, I'm 67 years old. I've been doing this work for almost 40 years, right? Okay. And obviously the majority of cases that I've handled will be women. Because, you know, you're a women's rights activist. You are yeah. uh, putting it out there. Women, you know, come to us, come to our organization. You know, you can talk to us. But there has been one case where uh, the, um, the the man was being battered. And mm -hmm. it, it can happen. I mean, because at the end of the day, domestic violence is about power, right? It's yeah. a way of controlling someone in an intimate relationship, right? It can happen, yeah. you know? Um, where, but I think the important ingredient that you must have when it comes to domestic violence was that person who's the victim, was that person, be it a man or a woman, was that person living in fear? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's about so fear. After people you. tell me about, oh, my wife shouts at me. You know, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm also suffering from domestic violence. But are you afraid to go back to the house? Are you afraid that, you know, in the middle of the night, you're going to be woken up and be beaten? I mean, mm -hmm. there were cases of women who said, look, I changed my behavior. I did whatever he wanted to do. And I just didn't ask any questions. And yet he wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, how come you're not asking me any questions? So I think if men suffer from this, oh, very important to ask, are you living in fear? Is there a yeah. cycle? You know, yeah, it is. So there's a criteria when it comes to domestic violence. So... Yeah. You know, so yes, there is. That's only been one case that I know of. Oh, wow. And of course, men was difficult to come out. It's very difficult for men to say, and be, this is to do with the gender construct. And, and that's to go why. So, women's activism, um, you know, yes. like, like, yeah, go to to someone like you and your organization back then. I'm and beaten, yeah, you know, you. It's hard because people don't like to accept the fact that men can be beaten, men can be, can live in fear, that men can be bullied. But we all know in real life, yes, of course, men can be bullied, especially men who are, uh, you know, who display feminine traits. They are bullied. It's yeah. a form of violence. In yeah. schools, you see that, you know, men who are young boys who are looking, who are behaving in a more feminine way, they do get bullied. They get beaten up. They get raped even, you know. Uh, I mean, look at the pattern here, Tasneem. Everything that's feminine is is despised. It's as if the feminine is something to be. It's really hard to hear it in the first place. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, it, but it's the truth, right? I mean, stop act like a man. Come on, you know, don't like a, like a woman. Don't cry mm -hmm. like a woman. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think um, but and this is why smashing the patriarchy frees everybody. We don't want men to have to be trapped in their gender roles too yeah. they're victims too in, in a way in no, a sense they yeah. are also having to play a particular role you mustn't cry mm -hmm. you mustn't tell anybody that you're being beaten up you know and we're talking not only about husband and wife it could be a son yeah it could be a yeah. young boy beaten up by the father yeah it could be a young boy beaten up by the mother mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. the perpetrators who are women can also happen in this context okay you asked me yeah. earlier about a man being beaten and uh, we started getting in women's aid organization around about the 90s and the mid 90s and even till now we started getting domestic workers from indonesia from the mm -hmm. philippines from cambodia from vietnam and they were running out of the household because they were being terribly abused and tortured by the employers Oh, yeah, that's and another story. All the cases that came up to us, it was the woman who was the perpetrator. But oh. obviously, the man is also living in the house, and mm -hmm. you know, they both are, you know, party to this, but the woman was perpetuating the violence. So okay. this was different dynamics altogether. But mm -hmm. at the end of the mm -hmm. day, it's power dynamics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, here's another question. Uh, have sure. uh, have you ever encountered a case where the woman was actually lying about domestic violence, about, suffer about being a victim of domestic violence? Because as you know, recently the world has witnessed the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard um, you know, trial that was televised. And a lot of men actually felt they avenged themselves through Johnny Depp because they're no longer the perpetrators, they're the victims now. Um, so what do you think of that? 
I mean, that's a bit of a sweeping statement to say now men are victims, right? You know, that's what they said throughout social media. Yeah. Okay, let me take your question part by part. Have yeah. women lied to us? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very few have lied. What have they lied about? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, a woman comes to us, she seeks, she seeks shelter. Yeah. You know, and she doesn't tell, tell you about an affair that she's having because she's afraid okay. if I say, if I have an affair, you're going to judge me. Mm. You know? And she thinks that maybe I do deserve the beating because I had an affair. Okay. And I'm not saying all women who are domestic violence victims or survivors are having affairs, but they hold back this. And then, okay. then of course, we reassure them there's no judgment here. It doesn't matter if you are, you know, the most terrible woman. You're a, you know, some of the, the, the perpetrators will call us up and say she's a bad wife. She doesn't know how to keep the house clean. She's a terrible mother. It doesn't matter if you're the worst mother in you are a worst mother, you're a terrible housekeeper, you're a bad cook, yes, you had an affair. All of these so-called misbehaviors or doesn't yeah. mean therefore you deserve to be battered. Our tagline at that time was no one deserves to be battered. Yeah. So they tend to lie when they think you're judging them. Mm -hmm. But has anybody lied and said, the husband beat me, my boyfriend beat me. And made up the story completely. No, I have to say it was very, It's in my experience, no. No, okay. Do they lie about the kind of violence? Do they lie about the context and the, the relationship they, they have? Yes, they mm -hmm. may lie about that, but never about the beating, you know? Okay. Um, so, of course, the Johnny Depp and the Hurt. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I, mean, I have to mention it. We're talking about this very subject. I know, I know, I know. I, know. <laughs> I mean, I. And it's really, a very peculiar thing. I mean, very, we're, we're used to I mean, the opposite thing. You know, it's. I know. It's actually and normally was the opposite. Pathetic, right? Uh, suddenly, Johnny Depp, the victim, right? And I, and I do believe that Johnny Depp was hit by his wife, Amber Heard. Mm -hmm. But I also believe by looking at some of the videos were shouting at her. We yeah. heard about you how... You can tell because you're an expert in here. I mean, you can... Yeah, I, don't I know. you followed it closely. We need the science because, you know, a, perp a domestic violence perpetrator is not just physical beating. Mm. Okay, remember, the perpetrator creates an environment of fear. Yeah. The perpetrator, you know, tends to... wants to control your life, will tell you what to wear, who your friends are, isolate you from... Your, your people, from your mm -hmm. family, your friends. And then there's also physical beating. But after a while, the physical beating stops. You just have to just look at the person and this is this really enough. It's all about yeah. control, right? So in the case of Johnny Depp, I couldn't help but ignore, I, I, could, I could not ignore the fact that he was slamming doors, he was slamming, not doors, he was slamming the uh, kitchen cabinets. Apparently, mm -hmm. he would call, uh, you know, the studio uh, to ask what is Amber Heard doing. Uh, he yeah. would tell her what to wear, um, who she with. He was very, very possessive and very suspicious. Again, another trait. Perpetrators, male perpetrators tend to be very possessive about their wives and girlfriends. But it you doesn't know, mean that he's, uh, he abused her, like, physically. It doesn't it necessarily abuse. mean. It's still abuse. It's still mental violence. Okay? Oh, yeah, but mental violence. Mental violence, economic violence, psychological violence, call it whatever it is, it's, it is still psychological violence and mental violence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So telling mm -hmm. you that you're ugly, telling you that you're, you're cheap, you're a slut, you know, yeah, so yeah. I couldn't yeah. know that some of the evidence that was coming out was about the control over his wife, Amber Heard. And of course, I could not ignore the fact that she was also fighting back and or she was also inflicting injury to this man, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, my very simple answer, I think they both were very abusive to each other. It was obviously <laughs> a very toxic marriage, you know. Yeah. But yes, the jury said that Amber Heard invented lie, invented stories and she did it with the malice. It may well be true. I, I'm not going to judge all of that. All yeah. I, I can see is, oh my God, these two people were very toxic. They <laughs> hurt each other very yeah. deeply hurt each other physically and mentally and obviously, you know, 
in terms of yeah. the, the it was it was a, this an ugly relationship but it doesn't mean now we stop believing women yeah it's a case of that's what happened man bites dog you know when the dog bites a man is quite common when man bites dog we go oh my goodness so in this case just because there is apparently or allegedly a case where she had injured or caused domestic violence or you know on against Johnny Hurt it doesn't mean that now we can say hey see i told you all along we were lying <laughs> that's what yeah that's what we kept reading on social media yeah. this is the danger and this is how toxic the environment is out there see i told you what women lie it reinforces mm -hmm. the whole notion that women lie yeah and yeah, i might yeah. even say that, you know in me allegedly and i want to say allegedly you know amber heard lied and embedded stories yes she she that's very damaging if that's all that's mm -hmm. true but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean i would stop you to stop believing women can you imagine the, the many many women out there who are so afraid now to say anything because they're going to say oh you're lying you're an amber heard yeah that started to happen that started to happen i mean it yeah i mean these th this and, case is yeah and, and it was very very weird i mean every time you turn on your youtube your social it's media everywhere the whole narrative was geared to be anti amber heard and pro johnny depp and i, I can't mean, maybe, help maybe that's the truth in that case but it does not necessarily mean that it's the truth with all women and men right so but also i'm questioning the the pr behind this you know mm. because it's very easy to keep putting out negative things about a particular person right it, it, you can manipulate social media well it happened to him right i mean that's the, he was her for six years i mean the narrative was against him now it's changed so yeah. i mean both of them are, are are victims that's all i can say i mean i think you're conclusion. right there's very well put yeah. i think both are victims both need help and um you know and also because we've had cases of uh, many women who who told us about uh their partners their husbands or boyfriends when they get very drunk when they're high mm -hmm. on uh you know drugs they yeah. tend to be more violent or tend mm -hmm. to be you know and and completely forget what they did right so yeah. and it was that and it was a fact you know uh mm -hmm. you know Amber, uh, sorry what's the name uh Johnny heard was an is an addict or was an addict i'm not sure but certainly he was also you know addicted to cocaine and yeah. so hopefully you know all of them will go out and get uh, hopefully he'll get some help on that too right but yeah. i'm not going to say definitely oh you know johnny hurt is a very nice man who didn't hurt a fly no i yeah. think he too caused harm she too caused harm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was just yeah. really ugly, yeah. So, um, uh, you work. Your work was focused mainly on um, on in the Malaysian context. Any yes. idea about other countries, uh, Muslim majority countries, or even you know the West um, on these cases, like um, domestic violence? Well, I, I not not only work in Malaysia. I also work in the Asia Pacific because I belong okay. to quite a number of regional organizations. Uh, we uh, we train. I have been. I've participated in training of in of women activists from France, from um, India, Sri Lanka, Philippines, Kyrgyzstan. Training them how to use the UN system. Training them how to use CEDAW. CEDAW is a women's treaty. So yeah. I do work with quite a number of women's groups, and well, I still continue to work with other groups. Yes, of course, everywhere in the country, everywhere in the world, the one thing that brings all of us together. In fact, if we look at the women's movement, the global women's movement, the one of the first um, issues they took up uh, they took up is, uh, is violence against women. They had mm -hmm. tribunals, they had, you know, um, they had, uh, what's this called, campaigns uh, in, uh, against violence against women and to recognize that, you know, the violence in the home is happening in the beginning the women's groups were fighting for the right to vote the right to uh what's this That's called how it, started. Um, yeah. the, it, it was all outside the house the right to work the right to work political but now back to the house the house 
what's happening mm. in the house. In the yeah. global women's movement, the early feminists were really focusing on violence against women. So, Tasneem, you're right. It doesn't matter which part of the world I travel to. In fact, I'm in the middle of a tr of, of, of training uh, educators from Nairobi, from the Philippines, from Nepal, from um, you know, from uh, Brazil, from Canada. And in the room, it's, it's a very multiracial, multi-country yeah. group of participants. And they all will tell you the same thing, that mm -hmm. violence against women, that domestic violence, sexual har harassment is very much an everyday occurrence in their respective countries. How, how about the laws in, in, in each of these countries? I mean, for example, in Tunisia, um, we're very celebrated um, in Tunisia yeah. here that we have yeah. the, the personal, um, you know, the code of, uh, the, the code of personal, um, you know, there's like um, laws um, uh, for women and we're very celebrated in the region because we have these laws that protect women um, and stuff. Uh, sorry, code of personal status. Um, but at the end of the day, I live in this country and I know that there are many, many cases of domestic violence happening every day. Um, so the fact that the, a law, a very successful one, a very drafted, uh, in a very beautiful way, is there doesn't mean, as you said earlier, that in real life it's, it's, it's practiced and implemented. So is there any country in the world where there is such laws and they're actually implemented? Because I'm getting hopeless here. <laughs> it's, not about the, it's not about the existence of the really law. Because there are laws in most countries, right? Yeah. I, mean, uh, I can't think of any other country that... I think most countries have some kind of a law. It could be, you know, in the penal code. Obviously, every country has some kind of criminal law that says you cannot hurt anybody. You know, you cannot hurt anyone. It may not yeah. be specific to a wife or a woman, but you cannot hurt anybody. But are there any countries that has that any countries that have a domestic violence or law that is perfectly implemented? Mm -hmm. Perfectly implemented. I wouldn't say perfectly, but at least like, like partially. Well, or like yes, I would say yeah. yes. Because yeah. I have I have had the benefit of traveling to some of these countries, uh, like you know in Australia, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, very specifically, I know in America, uh, because violence is very very high. It's one out of three women, and yeah. it's like every three hours, you know, every four hours, you know, some woman is sexually being abused in America. Wow. I have gone to to the different states, and again in America, there are different states and different levels of implementation. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely, there's a lot of support. You know, there are the the police have got domestic violence units. Mm -hmm. There is a unit that's specific, that's very specific. Police are trained to go into someone's home when you get, when they get an SOS or get an emergency call. They know yeah. to go. Like in the UK, not only do they go to the homes, they take cameras to take pictures mm -hmm. of the damage in the in, because you know when you walk into a house, there might there, there may be furniture might be damaged. You know that yeah. the, 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 the crime scene is there. You know, mm -hmm. um, so police are trained to separate the man and the woman to ask the questions because very often when you there's an emergency call you may enter a home and you know you may say everything okay ma'am and then she says it's okay i'm okay i'm fine because you're asking that question in front of the perpetrator yeah so police yeah. Are trained like this is happens in australia in uk and even in singapore i must say even singapore has got very good training of mm -hmm. police to separate the the two parties and to make sure that you the woman is told what, what asks this question quietly and in a separate room. And if the woman says nothing is wrong, everything is fine, the police person slips a, a phone number secretly yeah. to her so that she may call another time. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very effective. Like, yeah, it's very effective. So because we know, mm -hmm. they understand that domestic violence is very much a hidden problem. And women don't give up on their marriage that easily and also because it's a fear because he has told you if you ever leave me i will kill you if mm. you ever leave me, i will kill your mother if you ever leave me i will kill your our children i will kill yeah. your pet so that we must remember i said the component of fear is really important yes yes so yeah there are of course many places where you know the where the response is quick mm. like in america 
I never was able to go to a shelter because it's, it's, it's a big secret. I can't go to any shelter. Okay. It's, it's like a fortress, the shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in America, I noticed that, you know, a lot of the uh, fathers will say, but I have a right to see my children. But we all yeah. know through experience, in domestic violence situations, he will see the children and kidnap the children. Yeah, kidnap them. So that she comes back to him. Okay. So, that, so many of these stories, you know, where we have yeah. gone to rescue the children. In America, the court says, yes, you're allowed to see the children. The children are brought to a particular place, which has got security. Yeah. He enters the house and he plays with the children. She, the mother is not there. Mm. And then she has to leave. Okay. That means it, it is monitored. Mm -hmm, it is mm -hmm. do you think there's a yeah do you think there's yeah. a difference between um, Muslim majority countries and non-muslim um, countries in this regard in implementing these um, um, these laws if ever they exist in the first place oh no no I, I won't be so quick to say that you know it's worse in Muslim majority countries because I, I haven't really done as an in-depth survey but it's because we I live in a Muslim majority country we yeah. now have 24 hours protection. You know, so um, I would say that it's worse in countries which are still steeped in patriarchy, right? Okay, so nothing to do with religion. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't look India. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. it's in fact India is um, uh, where, 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 you know it's Hinduism and and of course they have all the other religions. They also practice other religions too. Yeah. Uh, it's a very very um, is so steep in religion. There are a lot of problems in India too. So it's not yeah. a Muslim problem or a Hindu problem or a Buddhist okay. problem, or for that matter, America, which is basically a Christian uh, country, right? I mean, I'm sure some mm -hmm. Americans will be, will, will be very offended if they say it's a Christian country, but you know, <laughs> it's not completely the secular. Yeah, really, secular. The, it goes back to good old patriarchy. It really mm -hmm. goes back to patriarchy, right? It talks, yeah. I mean, I really do not think it's worse because it's a Muslim country. That's because really here, like, press. If, yeah, yeah. If we talk, to, if we talk about Tunisia, for example, these uh, this code of personal status is presented as a Western triumph against Muslim values that they don't really believe in, and they think that Muslim Islam is linked to patriarchy, but it's not. It's not correct. I mean, women in Islam are really, you know, protected through so many things. And, um, you know, even the Sharia guarantees um, a lot of rights to her. And everything that's happening in the name of Islam is because of a bad understanding of the religion. So that's why I asked, because yeah. these kind of laws are, are often presented to as as as, as uh, secular and progressive and, and, and Western. And they're celebrated as such. But uh, for you as an expert, that's not true. That's not true at all, because I think, I mean, it's one of the reasons why Sisters in Islam, based in Malaysia, and also quite mm -hmm. a number of groups, I'm sure, elsewhere too, started going back to the text, started going back to the Quran. Mm -hmm. They wanted to go and read it for themselves to say, is this true? Is this really yeah. true? Can a man actually have four wives? You know, well, very, very strict conditions. Are you yeah. able to and just and love speaking of polygamy yeah i mean in, in when it happened it was actually restricted to four only the world was polygamous before they used to have like 20 and 30 women it only it was right? yes exactly yeah, yeah it was restricted to four with conditions so see it's exactly yeah. and, that, and if you were to follow the letter of the law it would be impossible to love two women three women four women equally and make sure that right. every you woman wouldn't, house, you wouldn't every be woman just yeah. yeah, so it's really actually almost impossible, right? So yeah. I think what people are not knowing, what we need to do is to really make sure that the world knows that there are Islamic scholars, women's rights activists, and feminists who are Muslim who are reinterpreting the law, who's bringing in jurisprudence that's more progressive and breathing life into Islam. We tend to only hear bad news. We do not tend to hear all the good things that are happening, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. Al Hazar University, Al Hazar in is it in Egypt? Is Al Hazar yes, in Egypt? Yes, in yes. Egypt. I mean, yeah. they, they 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 came up with a research to say that child marriage should not be allowed, right? Yeah. I mean, they did the research. They could, 
but no one seems to know about it. All we can say, oh yeah, you know, the Muslims, they all marry when they're young. Hello, <laughs> Indians and Hindus also marry when they're, they had to ban yeah. child marriage. So yeah. I think it's a, it, th this is a phenomena that we have, you know, that mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. the, word, the word is not phenomena. People just see. love sens yeah. sensationalizing. The world likes to think badly of Muslim nations. And again, that's what I meant by a false narrative. It's all mm -hmm. engineered, that's name. That's what I meant by Johnny Heard and the narrative. I want to yeah. know how many people were, you know, there were all these, you know, good press about him. Good, you know, there were... And the funny this thing is that six, for six years, year. right. the funny thing is that for six years, it was the opposite. The PR was against him. So yeah, yes. you're right. Maybe it's engineered. I mean, now the, the tendency now. was, yeah, the tendency was to hurt men. And now the tendency um, and the, you know, the world uh, wants to, wants the men to be, you know, the victim and to appear. Not right, the perpetrator right. in this. So, so it's really sad. Yeah. It's really bad PR. I mean, there is bad PR. People like to keep promoting bad PR about Islam. Who controls People like that? To, and all, and exactly who is <laughs> controls that. That is why you have to go back to yeah. who controls the media, right? Yeah. Who controls the internet? Who controls these false narratives? And, um, yeah. and that's why I feel very lucky to be in a country like Malaysia because you know, it's very easy because we have seen for ourselves, because we had to deal with the religion, because mm. we wanted children's rights, we wanted women's rights. And we were very lucky to have sisters in Islam working together because it is, you know, what is interesting about Malaysia is that women's groups come together and work together. We don't say, mm. oh, you are not a religious group, you are a religious group. We all come together and work. We just want to do good. And we will look at religious interpretations. Someone like me, even though I'm a person of another faith, I'll talk about Islam because as long as Islam is being used to formulate public policy, yeah. I'm going to say something about it because I'm a citizen, right? Yeah. And that is the, the kind of empowerment that we have, you know, not everyone, of course, I'm also, not everyone talks like this in a frank way. Of yeah, course, I know been, that you're very rare. I mean, that's really precious. I mean, yeah, because, I mean, a lot of people don't like it. They say, why is she say, talking about Islam? She's not a Muslim. And I'm going, yeah, I'm going to talk about it because it affects mm -hmm. my life. Because yeah. Muslim woman suffering is also, you know, I'm not going to keep quiet, right? So yeah. in a country like Malaysia, we have learned to grab the mic and we have learned to just create the space for ourselves. We don't wait mm -hmm. for it to be given to us. Mm -hmm. Um so going back to your original question, is it worse in Muslim majority countries? I think it's worse in any country where the patriarchy is strong. And guess what? The patriarchy, patriarchy is very strong in most countries, except I think it's in Europe. I think there, you know, you can see it, you know, where you can see equal numbers of pe uh, leaders, women leaders. You see cabinets with an equal number of, you know, lots of women in leadership. Mm. You can see when there is equality, in almost every aspect of their life, be politics yeah, or economics. It reflects on the, on the house. Yeah. Definitely, it, it, it reflects the society to then enjoy it. Okay. But as long as okay. societies are, are being controlled and led by only one party, in this case men, or mm -hmm. if for that matter, only one sect or one, one group yeah. of people, then there, that's going to be a problem. We have to have diversity. All right. Last question. I'm really enjoying um, this 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 um, this show with you. Um, last question. Um, do you have have you ever had men who were um, you know working with you um, in this um, in this in this thing like who are for this activism who are touring the world who are working with you in the association or any other kind of, um, yes, of work? Yeah. Yeah. So this is this this is where I'm telling you. I'm going to tell you a story where I was very prejudiced. Okay. You know, I was very prejudiced. So, women's aid organizations started by women. The staff were all women, and you know, it, and round about when I became the executive director. So first I was a volunteer member, then I became the executive director. Yeah. Uh, we advertised for a program officer, and we don't say women only, but I know that I when I don't even bother looking at the men's applicants, <laughs> I was prejudiced. 
you know, I would be the first person to admit I was prejudiced because I kept thinking, oh, no, men cannot do this work, right? And I was wrong. I was wrong. I'd be the first person to admit I was wrong. And, and then, you know, right? there, was, the there was a person, uh, his name is Yu Ren Chung. He's now the deputy executive director of Women's Aid Organization. Okay. Uh, of course, the, the, the executive director is a woman. Uh, you know, he's a deputy. And, um, you know, the, my uh, my colleague was looking through all the applicants' system. Have a look at his application. He's really, he's very, very good. He's worked with women's groups. He's, he's, he seemed to be really mature. And he says he really wants to work on women's rights. And I said, okay, okay, never mind. All right, <laughs> I, 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 will, I will interview him. You know, I was so stubborn about it. And when he came for the interview, he really opened up my eyes. Okay. And I could see yeah. a man who's standing in front of me, who's sincere, who's not going to use hierarchy. Because I'm asking questions like, I don't want in a meeting where you are speaking all the time. Mm. In any meeting, men love to mansplain, right? I mean, they like to take mm. over the meeting. I say, I do not want that kind of attitude. He said, no, I'm not that kind of person. So I had to really confront my own prejudices. And mm -hmm. now men are also working at women's aid organizations. Right. Men are also working with women's groups. But I want to say that men involved in women's rights work, it's not just for women. They should be also doing it for themselves, for men. Yeah. It helps. Yeah, it helps a lot. Yeah. I mean, you, because you're also freeing yourself. You know, yeah. the UN yeah. had this um, this tagline, he for she. Yeah. I have to say I hated it. I had to hate that. I didn't want he for she. Please, please, can we go he for he? Can you please go and help you're meant for you don't need to come and help me be with us work with us yes but don't go for i'm here to protect you because my mother my sister might be some no no no, no. please you're doing don't. it in another way that's that's it, wrong track in a different way right yeah <laughs> other men go and tell men to stop being you know be misbehaving men mm -hmm. must speak up when they see something wrong very very often the bystander keeps silent. You allow yeah. for these men to get away, yeah. right? Yeah. But even that is changing, I think, Justin. I think people ask. That's really good. That's really good. Yeah. All right. I mean, it's been almost an hour. I mean, time really flies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but inadequate yeah. and you couldn't stop me. Sorry if I kept jabbering. <laughs> no, no, no. If you want to say anything, um, just last oh, comments no, no. or anything about this. Thank you very much for making this into a conversation, you know, into makes it You're easy welcome. for me. Ask questions that I'm yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think after talking to, uh, to you about this, I think what what, I, what I've been seeing when I was researching you on the net, uh, they they called you a pioneer in in Muslim act in in, um, in women's activism, and I think they're right. So very well deserved. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, I hope our viewers um, enjoyed this talk and benefited as much as I did. And uh, thank you so much, Ivy, for being our guest. And I promise you to, um, you know, to have more uh, guests, uh, women guests in my show more than men. I have to work on this. You have to work on that. <laughs> Only three out of 12. That's not good. <laughs> yeah, that's not good at all. All right. Thank you very much. And goodbye. Thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts.